So hello, and welcome to the course forum on open access and data sharing in the humanities and social sciences. Today's forum of nearly 200 registrants would not be possible without the generous sponsorship coming from AIP Publishing, KGL, NISO, Geoscience World, and STM. Now a little bit about Chorus. We are a community effort dedicated to making open research work. Our goals are to help our main stakeholders of publishers, institutions, and funders scale their OA compliance. We work to develop metrics about open data. We improve the overall quality of their metadata related to open research. And we host forums and workshops like today's forum to connect the stakeholders so they can learn and hopefully build trust with each other. As our speakers present today, feel free to use Zoom's QA feature found at the bottom of the Zoom window to ask your questions. They'll either be answered by the speakers live or in the QA window. Also, feel free to upvote questions that you think are important so we are sure to get to them. So today's forum will run until 12 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time and will also be recorded for later viewing. We have an excellent lineup of speakers for you today. We have Erin Pollard, who is the ERIC Project Officer for the U.S. Department of Education, Alicia Hoflick, Moore, who is the Data Management Research Associate at the University of Minnesota, and we have two from Taylor & Francis, Rebecca Taylor Grant, who is the Head of Open Data Initiatives, will be presenting, and Emily Farrell will join her. Um, she is the Open Access Channel Lead, and she'll join us for the Q&A. So I will be your moderator for today. I have that honor. So allow me to make some opening remarks. Today, we are diving into a topic that is rapidly transforming the landscape of research and scholarship in our fields. Open access and data sharing are not just buzzwords. They represent a shift towards more collaborative, transparent, and inclusive academic practices. Scholars, educators, and practitioners in the humanities and social sciences often work with data and research that have the power to shape societies inform policy and deepen our understanding of human culture and behavior. But how can we ensure that this valuable knowledge is accessible to all? How can we leverage open access to faster innovation and drive forward new discoveries? Today's session will explore not only the principles of open access and data sharing, but also the practical implications for our work. We'll discover how to navigate new requirements, the opportunities for increased visibility and impact, and the challenges that may arise, particularly regarding data sensitivity, intellectual property, and the diverse nature of research in our fields. Whether you're new to these concepts or already an advocate, this webinar aims to provide you with insights, practical strategies, and a deeper understanding of how these practices can benefit your work and the broader academic community. So before today's event, we sent out a poll and so I wanted to share with you some of the highlights of that poll to actually prime some of your, your thoughts. So first we asked in the poll, why are you attending today's event? Some general interest was about how OA is working across different disciplines. Then we had you know, a large number of librarians attending today. So obviously there's interest in supporting their faculty. And then there were concerns on how to keep connecting with content um, along with shrinking budgets. But then we asked a different question, focusing more on the potential challenges about data sharing in, in HSS. And here you can see that there were concerns about data and information silos, lack of interoperability, costs, money, funding, permissions, storage locations, citations, it was a lot. There were issues with data availability statements, the issues with bandwidth, knowledge and training, infrastructure to meet the mandates. And also HSS researchers don't see themselves as using data. And there seems to be a general lack of understanding about it. So I don't know about you, but I think that gives us a lot for us to start with. And so I'm gonna turn over now to Erin to get us started. And uh, it's gonna be a great session and I look forward to listening to all of you and hearing your questions. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, so I'm Erin Pollard and I am the project officer for ERIC in the US Department of Education. Next slide, please. And the Institute of Education Sciences is a nonpartisan research arm of the department. 
And our mission is to provide scientific evidence on which to run education, practice, and policy and share this information broadly. Um, so we are multidisciplinary, but mainly social scientists. Um, so we find people who are trained as sociologists, psychologists, um, as well as some economists. So while we do do some communities, we are mostly a social science agency. Um, and when we think about what we fund, we fund, um, next slide please, we fund both grants and contracts to do research. And we publish both intramural, which means, uh, well, sorry, we publish um, both work by the US Department of Education. We are, have independent publishing authority. Um, on the slide here, but we also have a lot of external grants that are field initiated research that publish in peer reviewed journals. So by statute, all of our work must be peer reviewed. However, it does not mean that it's published in peer reviewed journals. We have education has a rich history of gray literature, um, which in a minute. So in terms of scale, we are a fairly large by social science um, definition of agency, we fund about $375 million of research a year, and that funds about a thousand pieces of research, meaning peer reviewed articles or manuscripts. Um, this comes from roughly between 160 and 180 grants per year and about 50 research contracts. So next slide, please. Um, our repository is ERIC. Eric is 60 years old. We just had our birthday and we are a free online database of education research. We regularly index content from about 2000 publishers. A little over half of them are journal sources and about um, 700 of them are non-journal sources, meaning grade literature sources. So this could be anywhere from the US Department of Education or HHS to think tanks, um, school districts, a whole wide variety. We have about 2 million records and a little over half of them are peer reviewed and about a quarter of them have the free full text as available in ERIC. So that means that they've given ERIC permission to display the full text. Many more of them are open access on the publisher's website, um, but we don't count them because we do not have that um, essential guarantee that we can publish the full text for um, in perpetuity in ERIC. Um, so links can break, organizations go down. So we say about a quarter of our content has full text available in ERIC. So next slide, please. So starting in 2011, uh, IES adopted the a public access plan that preceded what many of you might have heard of as a Holdren Memo, which is a government-wide initiative for large research agencies to make all federally funded research available to the public free of cost. Um, under our public access policy, and I say current, this means as of for the next, what, 18 days, 19 days, this is what is governing all of our currently funded work. September 3rd or October 1, things are going to change. So as of today, our current policy is that our awardees have to submit an electronic version of their final manuscript. Um, this does not have to be the journal version. It can be the peer reviewed manuscript to Eric upon acceptance of publication. And for about 700 of our sources, they do this on behalf of their awardees. Um, Eric will make that citation available to the public shortly after it's published. And then the final manuscript or article, depending on the permissions, will be made 12 months after that article is published. So next slide, please. In 2012, or sorry, 2022, um, the White House came out with a new policy called the Nelson Memo. And this required federal agencies with research and development, all federal agencies that spend money on R&D, to update their policies um, to provide a couple key new features. So next slide, please. All right, so the key elements of the policy are that work needs to be made available immediately after it is released, okay? There's a typo on that slide, which I'm just realizing now. Um, so once work is released, it needs to be in ERIC or our repository, but for the Department of Education, it's always ERIC. The publications seem to be machine readable that is defined by the White House, operationalized as website text, um, not in PDF format, which for education, we know our users really like their PDFs. They want the PDFs. Um, but this policy says they need to be available in XML, um, HTML. I'll show you an example of what I mean in a minute. So publications seem to be freely and publicly available by default. And then the data from the study must be released at the same time as the publication. And I'll get into that in a minute. So next slide, please. 
So under our current policy, what it is for today, the way this works is that an article is released as an online first on the publisher's website. I'm going to say in month one. And the timeline here can be squishy because every publisher is different. We then, um, the, the grantee sends that article to Eric and we add it to Eric as a gray literature document. About 15 months later, it can be anywhere from six to 18 months later, the article moves out of online first to be officially published by the publisher. That means assigned to a volume issue. And the publisher then sends Eric the metadata for that. And we, if it is a, a journal that we've been regularly indexing, we add it to Eric. That typically happens about 18 months after an article comes out as online first in the social sciences. That starts at 12 month clock for when that full text becomes available. So we don't typically then see the full text becoming available until after that point. And then it's not right away, it sometimes takes a little longer. So what we typically see is it's been three years from when an article first is available on a publisher's website to when it is, sorry, not, it's about two and a half years from when it's first released on a publisher's website to when we can display it in error. Next slide, please. Okay, under the updated plan, and this is IES plan because when I submitted the slides, um, it was an IES plan, but we just got approval to move this for department wide um, starting in October 1 um, for newly funded awards. So articles released as online first on a publisher's website, just like they are today. At that time, within five days, an awardee has to submit a package to Eric, and we will make this website text into HTML or the Word document, the article into HTML, XML, website text. We'll do all the transformation. We'll put it online and it will be available that same month to the public free of charge. Then the publisher can publish the article whenever they do. And Eric will update that record one, for sources that are already indexed in Eric once that um, metadata is sent to us by the publisher. So the public te full text is going to be available much faster. Okay, next slide, please. So I mentioned the new format of website text and I've been calling it HTML and XML and I apologize for that. Um, so previously, this is not what we are proposing. This is from um, a publisher, I believe it is Sage, um, but it, I'm showing you as an example of what it will look like while we are still working out what it will look like. So we currently index just PDFs because that is what we know users love, but it's not really Available how machine readable it is. So now it's going to be available in as one gigantic page that users in theory could read. Again, knowing the social scientists that I work with and educators, they're going to still choose that PDF. But we will make this metadata available so computers can read that, or the full text available so um, machines can read it and it can be used in machine um, AI, that kind of thing, machine learning. All right, next slide, please. In addition, we are adding a whole bunch of metadata to the records to help make connections. So we will be adding ORCID IDs, which is really nothing new. We've been doing this for years, but now it's gonna be required. We're gonna be having DOIs to the publisher's version of the article, which again, is nothing new, something we've been doing for many, many years. Um, we are gonna be adding increased links to the grant funding information. Again, we have been doing this for years. We're just gonna be doing this differently. It is a new requirement, but it's also standard practice. And we're going to be adding links to the underlying data, which we've been doing anyway, but this is now just part of this new requirement. So next slide, please. So how are we going to implement the changes? This is going to put more burden on the awardees. They're going to have to submit the package to Eric um, with increased metadata, as well as instead of sending us just the PDF, they're also going to have to send us the Word document and the images and alternative text so we can build this up. We expect that this will be a little more burden, but we aren't, we're still working through how can we make this as seamless as possible for our awardees because we don't want this to be too burdensome, but we are gonna need a little bit more from them. Eric is then gonna create the file and post it on the website and awardees, what well, we want all of those pieces of the record to be available when they submit it to us. We also know that sometimes that data set may, while well, it's required to be available, may not yet be available. Um, or they may not have their ORCID IDs just yet. Um, so they're going to be able to update that record um, and put it in a request if the data just aren't available right away. So next slide, please. So a question I get asked all the time is, right now we have 700 publishers that are depositing on behalf of their awardees. Do we expect this to continue? So the answer is yes, which is the 
they can, but we don't really expect this to happen because that's not how our agreements are currently set up. It would require publishers to send us um, the full text when it is an online first in a format that we can use, um, which is not really a model that we see happening, but we are happy to explore this if publishers want to have those conversations. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and so then the last bit that is changing that I really wanna focus on, because this is a huge deal for humanities and social sciences is our data requirements. So for education, we are not like the physical science agencies that deal with rats and mice and stars and things. We deal with tiny humans. And specifically when you look at what the Department of Education funds, it's a lot of tiny vulnerable humans, those with um, disabilities, those who are homeless, those who have additional needs due to poverty. So these are multiple kinds of protected classes. We also, in, a, in all, almost always minors, um, we do do some post-secondary work. These, the data we also use, we don't want it to be having students tested nonstop. So a lot of times we use administrative data, which means the researchers don't own the data. They get a license from the school district to use that data. And under many state laws, they are, um, so many different laws will prohibit a researcher from sharing those data with the Department of Education and with the public because we want to protect students' privacy. So the policy says that we expect all data collected to be made freely and freely available and publicly accessible by default at the time of the publication. And if you can't publish within award closeout, your data need to be made um, available within five years or at award closeout, whatever happens first. So that is the policy. However, huge caveat is if researchers believe that full data access is not possible, such as due to state or federal law, you have to provide a written rationale that's gonna be public in your data management plan. And you need to describe, you need to make what you can available and explain to users how they can go about getting the data, um, who to contact, what to ask, or how to merge. So what I am expecting is that we are going to see a lot more information about how to obtain the data, but unlike in other fields, we are not gonna be seeing a ton, new, ton of new data set because of state and district policies and laws. And I believe that is it. So next slide, please. Yes, um, so if you have any questions, feel free to contact me um, and I look forward to the Q&A. All right, hello. I will um, take it on from there. So thank you, Erin. Um, my talk actually um, proceeds pretty well from where Erin picked up. So uh, my name is Alicia Hovick moore I work in the College of Liberal Arts, um, a center called Lattice, the University of Minnesota. And if you move to the next slide, um, just to give you a little bit more sense of where I'm coming from. So um, the group I work in within CLA at the University of Minnesota provides support um, for research in every phase of the research life cycle. So um, we support researchers from planning to data collection to analysis, as well as data sharing and meeting these um, current and new data sharing mandates. We also have specialized labs for spatial and object imaging. So we call that ASOS that helps support research, um, both from the sciences to the arts and humanities. We um, do a lot of work with the arts and humanities in that lab. Um, I'm also connected to our university libraries and I curate for our institutional data repository, which is um, a place that uh, researchers can deposit their data to meet federal sharing requirements, making those available publicly. Um, and I participate in the Data Curation Network, which is a multi-institutional group focused on supporting high quality, ethical, and fair data sharing. Um, and so picking up where Aaron left off, talking about some of the challenges with data sharing, particularly in the social sciences and humanities. So I'm gonna talk both what I've seen from my team's perspective and my work as a data curator for our um, institution, as well as some of the research we're doing more broadly through the Data Curation Network. So let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so first I wanna start talking about some of the features of what makes like an ideal data sharing. Um, so in the sciences and in some um, data sets that don't have these um, sensitivities or legal requirements, as Erin mentioned, um, most ideal data sharing is done through a dedicated archival data repository. 
Um, and this is also pretty prevalent in the um, social sciences, but this is the, the standard ideal way in the sciences. And so in this kind of data sharing, files are made available in open format. So in this example from um, Dryad, we have a comma delimited tabular format. Um, hopefully there are scripts that reproduce the analyses, ideally um, taking also the processing steps from raw data to the final um, outcomes and analyses. There's also documentation that fully explains the data and scripts. The files are available openly, so anyone can access them without any delay or cost. Um, and there's standard metadata. Um, so in addition to publications, data um, are encouraged to have metadata, such as persistent identifiers for the data in terms of a DOI, um, ORCID IDs of the authors, information about their affiliations, the fundings, other related studies, um, the related article. In the um, when it's related to um, a published work. So if we think about these features as the goalposts to meet in terms of data sharing, especially in terms of complying um, with the Nelson memo, then when it comes to social sciences humanities data, there are a number of barriers um, that can make reaching these goalposts more time consuming, more costly, um, and potentially require infrastructure that just doesn't exist yet. So next slide. So one of the biggest challenges that Aaron also mentioned um, in the social sciences is that we often work with data from humans. Um, so all sorts of humans, from tiny vulnerable humans to other kinds of humans. Um, and not everything we collect can or should be shared. And so this is rightfully so. Um, data sharing policies are strongly encouraging researchers to make what they can available. So make it as open as possible and as close as necessary. But unfortunately, determining what this means for a given data set and how this should be handled is not a trivial question. And it's also one that's often left to the individual researcher to determine for their own project. Um, it can be costly in terms of time and money. If data are released into a repository with restricted access capabilities, so it's not public, but there's some sort of vetting that happens between the request and when data are released, um, sometimes the researcher takes on this role, and so then they have to take on this role of evaluating and granting those requests for long after the grant ends. So some repositories like Harvard Dataverse, this is the model. There are some other repositories that manage this work on behalf of the data author. So the Qualitative Data Repository or Open ICPSR and ICPSR um, in general. Um, but this also often requires a cost to cover this work through an institutional membership, through a cost that the author writes into their data management plan and their budget when they're looking at the grant. Um, or sometimes this cost is passed on to reusers of the data. So in the case of open ICPSR, um, often if users aren't a member institution, they may have to pay to access restricted data. And this is rightfully so. There's a lot of work involved in vetting and giving access to data. Next slide. Um, other data sets might be appropriate for public sharing that doesn't require mediated access, but only after considerable recoding and de-identification to prepare it for public sharing. So a limited data set, as Aaron mentioned. Um, so here on this slide, I have an example of a public use survey data that I was actually a collaborator on and also helped curate for our data repository. And so we submitted this to our public facing institutional repository, but we probably spent about 20 to 40 hours going through and determining between myself and the lead author on this, um, how to best collapse the categories to not lose the meaning in the data, um, but still protect uh, the participants who responded um, to make sure the consent was appropriate. And then we also um, did some post cleaning using an R package called SDC micro to computationally apply case suppression for some of the remaining variables because we still couldn't get it below a certain K anonymity. So there's a lot of work that goes in to preparing a data set for public sharing. Next slide. Um, from a repository point of view, there's also challenges here too because um, policies and guidelines sometimes change over time. So here is an example from our um, institutional repository as well, where early on we accepted a data set in an open format that many years later when we had more staffing and more capability and more expertise in this area, it conflicted with the norms 
um, of data sharing for this kind of data. And so, um, and we had had a new human participant policy in our repository too, that kind of put some guide rails on um, what kinds of things we would accept and not. So um, we had a data that a data set currently that violated this. And so this was also time and effort on the repositories end to make sure the things we've accepted in the past comply with the current policies that we have. So um, this took, again, considerable time and effort on the part of us as the repository, as well as the original researcher to kind of come to agreement on how to um, remove that data from our system while not losing the documentation. And so what we've landed on is a documentation only um, entry. And so the data have to be requested from the author or found through another source. Next slide. Um, so when we talk about, so these are all in the social sciences with sensitive data. Um, but when we talk about sharing in the humanities, um, there are also another of different, uh, another, a number of different challenges here. So for example, one large challenge is that data sharing or sharing the materials that underlie scholarly work in the humanities isn't the same as other fields. So often it's not just what is shared, but it's also the experience of how people interact with materials is what's fundamental um, about sharing humanities scholarship, not just what those materials are. So to help demonstrate this, I have um, one example is the um, global jukebox. And so here it's shared on the website. It's an elaborate, beautiful digital, digital exhibit um, on a website that you can explore. And so embedded in the sharing is the curation of the experience of how people go through and interact with materials, something that goes beyond maybe scanning through file names in a repository and downloading them as you would in a traditional data repository. And so if you contrast this, this uh, global jukebox also has the code available in GitHub. And just seeing these two side by side, there is a stark contrast between um, what the experience is, um, seeing the traditional repository view versus the website on how people should be experiencing these materials. So next slide. Um, and at the University of Minnesota, we have very, um, a lot of this happens um, for our scholars too. So we have a lot of scholars who build similar sharing platforms for their work. Um, and when it comes to supporting, maintaining, preserving this content, it looks a lot different um, and requires both different skills and different infrastructure than what our data curators have um, and what our repository is built on. So often these custom websites involve plugins that change over time. Um, they require um, money to keep going. They require dedicated web team to maintain them so they don't break. Um, and universities are also facing budgetary pressure and we're often cutting and centralizing support of website development because people think of that as not something we should be putting a lot of energy into in the year of 2024. Um, and so this kind of leaves humanity scholars who have run out of funding to support their um, digital exhibitions in the, in the large. And so I wanna, um, next slide please. The um, last two points I want to make are um, some broader work we've been doing as part of the Realities of Academic Data Sharing Initiative, which is built out of the Data Curation Network and the Association of Research Libraries. And so showing that I, in this extra time, effort, and technical support um, to make social sciences and humanities data available does cost money. And we know from research we've been doing about how much um, uh, researchers are spending on data management and sharing currently. So even before some of these new data sharing open access mandates are hitting, um, those with smaller grants are spending an outsized proportion of their budgets on data management and sharing. Um, and sitting in the College of Liberal Arts, I know that humanities and social science grants are typically much smaller than those in the biomedical fields. And so in the survey, we had interviewed 255 PIs across six institutions, and we divided the projects by the overall grant awards. So what you see in the graph here is the um, percent of their overall award budget that they reported spending on data management and sharing to support their grants. Um, and so the smallest grants uh, amounted to about 15% of their total award. And that's um, compared to the overall average taking in all the um, grants was only about 
So um, I know that um, in the social science humanities, these are definitely on the smaller end. So they're going to be facing um, a higher proportion of these costs for their grants. Um, and the last thing I want to mention, and so next slide, um, a final challenge is just keeping track of it all. So I mentioned in the ideal data sharing um, that has a lot of metadata baked in. A lot of that metadata is machine readable um, and can be searched and propagated to other search engines. Um, but this is a challenge. So another arm of the reality of academic data sharing is also um, seeing how well we can find data that have been published. And so we looked at um, repositories and how um, uh, um, how well the metadata fields called out by the Me Nelson memo, such as um, persistent identifiers for people and institutions and funded research and, and um, uh, related uh, publications and um, whether they exist or not, how complete they are. And so um, we're finding that repositories currently aren't often pushing this metadata found locally in the infrastructure, which makes it extremely difficult to track how and where these data have been shared. Um, and most of the results we found looking from affiliation were, only came from about 10 publishers. And we know that there's many more places that data are being shared including locations that aren't granting DOIs, especially when we think about um, humanities work that are in websites and how do we make sure those are tracked and propagated and have metadata that are searchable is another challenge. So um, how do we count them fairly and transparently is something we'll have to um, address in the future. So I just have a wrap up slide this is my very last slide, I'm kind of talking through the costs um, the challenges we face and that the global infrastructure um, really isn't prepared both to preserve projects in the humanities um, or to really track um, a lot of the ways our researchers are sharing data um, in a consistent way. So I will pass it on to Rebecca. Great, thanks so much, Alicia. Um, so I think I'll be picking up on some of the strands that Alicia and Erin mentioned, um, speaking from the perspective of an academic publisher. Um, I think we've touched a couple of times on the impact of the OSTP Nelson memo and how that will be changing things for uh, grantees of the federal agencies um, publishing in humanities and social sciences. Um, some of our authors at Taylor and Francis may be funded by um, those federal agencies, but obviously many won't be. Um, so I'll try and touch on some of the expectations coming from other stakeholders in this landscape too. If we get to the next slide. Just in case anyone isn't familiar with Taylor and Francis, um, quickly, we're an academic publisher. Uh, we publish across all disciplines. Um, we're probably best known for publishing in the humanities and social sciences, um, both in journals and books. Um, I'm also a humanities person myself, um, mostly focused on data sharing in the humanities and social sciences. So next slide. So I wanted to focus in on publishers' data sharing policies and how they can support uh, data sharing in humanities and social sciences and our experiences at Taylor and Francis in using data policy to encourage more data sharing. Um, and I think um, both Erin and Alicia have mentioned some of the challenges and I'll speak about others we've seen. Um, so if you are not familiar with how publisher data sharing policies tend to work, uh, they've become much more prevalent, I'd say, since the mid 2010s. So at that point, uh, many of the larger publishers started introducing more consistent policy frameworks across their journals. Um, and if you look um, at journals with data sharing policies in place, you'll tend to see quite standard requirements. So journals will require the sharing of data sets, whether that's on request or sometimes using data repositories, um, often requirements for citing data sets or adding them to the reference list or bibliography, uh, usually a requirement to include a data availability statement in a manuscript so that readers can understand how the data can be accessed. Um, and there's a number of different drivers for policy implementation at journals. Um, Actually, I think a lot of the early data policy implementation did come more from community expectations around data sharing. So you'll see in 
uh, life sciences journals, there is a tendency to have much more stringent data sharing requirements. And that's, I think, coming quite strongly from the uh, genetics and genomics communities. There's just an expectation that that data should be made open. Uh, we're also interested in what's happening in stakeholder policy. So, uh, for example, when something changes, like the um, introduction of the Nelson memo, um, that makes us consider, well, how do we align what our journals are doing? How can we support authors and the, these new expectations on them? And then obviously reasons around reproducibility, robustness, transparency of research, trying to uh, address research integrity, fears, um, all good reasons for journals to introduce data sharing policies. Um, when you look at what seems to be happening in the humanities and social sciences journal space, there is a tendency for policies to be quite weak. So it's quite rare to see data sharing mandates that require data to be shared in a data repository. Um, and then maybe more surprisingly, they are almost never written specifically for humanities and social science scholars. So if you look at the wording, um, they're exactly the same as what you'll see in a life sciences journal. Um, so um, I think kind of making it slightly more difficult for HSS authors to understand what's being asked of them. So next slide, please. Um, so I think, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, Erin and Alicia already touched on a lot of this, like why is it that this is perhaps more challenging? Why is it more difficult for a HSS scholar to um, understand what's being asked of them? And I do think humanities and social sciences are a little bit different in this regard. Um, already mentioned, I think humanities researchers, there's definitely an assumption that, that they won't understand or recognize the term data when it comes to their type of research. Um, Often involving perhaps copyrighted sources. So if you're using materials from um, a gallery or a library or, or an archive, you don't own the rights to it. So how can you share that? Um, and just less infrastructure in general around humanities data sharing. So not that there aren't any humanities data repositories, of course there are. Um, I say they're not quite so prominent or well known in the humanities. Um, social sciences research, again, we've um, already spoken about it. Um, we talked about tiny humans, um, the uh, innate sensitivity of data about people, um, and then the likelihood that you might be researching something that is quite a sensitive topic. Um, participant consent, so if you did want to share the data that you collected during your study, um, you would need to already have your participants consenting to that. Um, and then I think, uh, was it Erin who mentioned licensing of data sets as well? So kind of similar to the humanities, you just don't own the data. So how on earth could you share it? So if we go to the next slide. <coughs> um, so we'll focus in a little bit more on humanities here. Um, these are some results from a survey that a group of publishers came together under the STM Association, which is an industry publishing body, um, to investigate these assumptions we made around data sharing in the humanities. So I think we um, already considered uh, maybe these authors don't really know what they're being asked to do. Um, the terminology we use in data policies doesn't really resonate with them. Um, obviously, we had a self-selecting group of respondents, um, so that will bias the results a little bit. Um, we had 400 researchers um, globally respond to us, and I think the results were quite positive. Uh, we did write this up in the State of Open Data um, back in 2022. If you'd like to see the full results, we also have the full survey data available if you'd like to reuse it or have a look. Um, so uh, nearly 90% of respondents did say that data sharing is either important or very important in the humanities, though, as I said, these are people responding to a survey about data sharing. 81% um, recognise the term research data supporting output of the research process, either sometimes or all of the time. I think that was kind of surprising. So we did assume that there would be other terminology that these scholars might prefer, um, but they seem to understand that research data could be a part of their research process. Uh, we also got some information about how they tend to share data. Um, the most widely used method was peer-to-peer -peer transfer. So that, that's something like sharing on request via email when a colleague asks you to. Um, some were using data repositories um, and then websites were also quite commonly used. And I think um, what Alicia was speaking to cite like the idea that you lose something from a digital humanities project when you take it from its website context um, is quite important here. Um, so we were thinking then about how could we improve these data policies? So these, these policies that tend to be written for the life sciences 
to be more appropriate for, for journals in humanities and social sciences. So next slide, please. Oh, and again. <laughs> Um, so we decided to redraft some of our journal guidelines with a focus on humanities and social sciences, um, and this was a policy for open data, so a requirement that the data is shared um, openly in a data repository. Uh, we wanted to better support authors on our journals, so make sure that we were doing our best to explain what the expectation was. Uh, we wanted to be really clear on what we meant when we said data, so what exactly were we asking them to share completely remove that life sciences focus on policy wording, any references that wouldn't resonate with our HSS audience. Um, and then also look a bit more broadly at what was happening. Um, there's lots of work going on in the humanities data sharing space um, and social sciences too, of course. So what could we bring in that had already been established by the community as best practice? How could we integrate that? And always thinking about how do we align with what's happening with emerging stakeholder policy? Um, I think I think when we started this project, then a Nelson memo hadn't been published, but Horizon Europe was already requiring data sharing for um, humanities and social sciences, UK's AHR AHRC, for example. So there's all kinds of points of alignment where we see this emerging in funder policy, and we want to make sure that we can support the data sharing methods that our authors should be complying with. So next slide, please. Um, so we have published our revised guidelines. If you're interested, I'd really encourage you to take a look. Um, I think they're quite like user friendly and accessible and we are still taking feedback if people had thoughts. Um, the journal that we publish them on is called Routledge Open Research. So you can see at the bottom of the slide, we have a tiny URL going to Roar Policy. Um, so I think one of the key things that we were thinking about is what exactly is this data? What are the sources that a humanities or a social sciences author might use? And can we give more appropriate guidance depending on what it was that they built their research around? So we have really specific guidance, like if you went and licensed a third party data set, what do we expect from you? If you went to a gallery and um, like used a physical resource from an archive, how are you supposed to describe that in a data statement? Uh, we redrafted all of the terminology, so completely rewritten from a HSS perspective, um, taking out anything that was more STM focused. All of our examples in the policy text are from humanities and social sciences, so you can see what a good data availability statement might look like or how you might format a citation to an archival document. Um, and as I said, looking at integrating that best practice that was already out there. So um, one example is the British Library had done some work around citing digitized cultural heritage. So we made sure to include that um, because that's the kind of guidance that these authors need and they won't find it um, elsewhere. So if we go to the final slide, just to wrap up, um, I think so we uh, implemented this in 2022 and I think the biggest change has been the engagement with data availability statements, because what we were finding, especially in humanities, is that the authors would say, well, that doesn't apply to me. I don't want to write one of those. I can't share any data. Um, and that's really changed. If you go and have a look on the Routledge Open Research Journal, you'll see there's a really rich, like diverse types of data being shared. Uh, we are rolling this out across other journals. So it's already on our um, Open Research Europe platform, which is um, publishing for uh, the European Commission. Um, I think we're ready to address external stakeholder policy requirements, so I'd like to think that we're quite well aligned if um, grantees from a federal agency want to publish in one of these journals, what they're being asked to do um, by the journal should be helping them to share their data rather than hindering or confusing them. Um, and I suppose um, kind of headline is that I think we've had a really positive outcome from what I think of as being relatively simple updates to policy wording. So standing back thinking about what exactly it really was we wanted these authors to do and then writing it out clearly has had quite a significant impact I think um, and then just finally uh, we published an academic paper on the process of developing a policy for HSS data so I just popped the DOA there in case anyone's interested so thank you I'm looking forward to your questions. Great um, that now that now takes us up to our Q&A. So I'd ask all of our speakers to come back on. I'm gonna stop sharing for a sec. All right, 
So, and for our attendees, uh, please do ask your questions in the QA box. I do see that we do have one, which I think is a good one, and I'll let any of, any of you address it. But it, it says here, can you go over the costs of data management and sharing a little bit more and exactly how they can be addressed? And I'm glad someone asked that because actually I was going to ask something very similar. So who would like to handle that? Um, I could take the first stab at it and then I will pass it um, to Erin and Rebecca. So one thing that um, we have done in the Realities of Academic Data Sharing Project is we recently re re released a report where we tried to, okay, how do we take the first, um, how do we measure this, right? This is a hard thing to measure. So we, we tried to kind of do this and see what happens. So we used a mixed method, um, both survey and interview data of um, PIs. We focused on three different federal funders, NIH, NSF, and DOE um, in a few different discipline fields. But this really came down to um, assessing the time people spent on data management. We had a number of activities that are also published, and I can find the DOI in a minute, on like what are the actions um, involved in data management sharing. So thinking through how you do those and how much time it takes and also the cost of infrastructure. And so we did a lot of work trying navigating the space of all the different actions that you might do to make data available for public use. And then also um, how, what kind of infrastructure do you rely upon to make that happen? And so a combination of those, and we interviewed and surveyed researchers as well as administrators across six institutions. So I put the DOI in the chat, um, at least our guess, and we're um, expanding this to other institutions now as ongoing work. Thanks, Alicia. Someone else? Yeah, I would say that when we look at the cost, I don't have a number, but it depends on how you, what we have found to save costs as one knowing that you are required to do this at the beginning and writing your documentation and your steps along the way. So you are preparing your data to share. So that means that when, uh, for those of you who are researchers, when you are writing in your variable names or when you're creating variables, you put in good notes in your do file or whatever program you're using. Um, you put in descriptions. You set up your data as if you are going to be sharing it from the beginning. That saves a huge amount of costs. The other things that we see is it depends on if you're using your own data um, so if you're going out to collect data and creating your own data set and cleaning it and sharing it, that's going to be way more expensive than if you are using someone else's data that is already clean. Um, and so, so that's something that we've been looking at as a cost. Um, so some costs can be saved by just preparing as you go along. Others are thinking about when you need administrative data versus collecting your own. And then the last thing is, where does it store? So our contractors, a lot of them are storing their data in the National Center for Education Statistics because they're government reports. That's where you keep the restricted use files. That we, there's no cost to the awardee there um, because it's covered through a separate appropriation. But if you have to store it somewhere else, you're gonna have to think about those long-term costs. And so we encourage our awardees to think about it as they're budgeting and writing up their grant budget, but also know that the costs are constantly shifting as we see on the pub side. So. We don't have a good model, but we are working to try to figure out what steps we can do to reduce costs. And that's why we put out a guide that I put in the Q&A um, to try to help people think through how to do this, but then also to start looking at different models and learn from each other. So if the costs aren't what you originally thought, figure out how to rework your budgets so that you can make sure that you share your data in a meaningful way. Terrific. Uh, Rebecca or Emily, do you? Want to add anything? Um, I think publishers are just so far downstream from this. <laughs> like even giving guidance on what the data is or looks like is challenging because it's it's not really the time when the researcher is considering any of that. So we do try and avoid like sometimes we talk a little bit about data management planning, but I think we're not best placed to have that conversation with the author. Okay, great. Though I do wonder, I mean, this is probably just thinking too too far along, but I, I just to to second what you'd said, Erin, that that there does make such a difference when this process is thought of from the very beginning, and and you hope that having these policies in place over time will mean that there are more researchers starting from the beginning, taking care of these these um, practices from the outset, um, and knowing that we have repeat authors, the more that we kind of although we're downstream, the more that we support that perhaps. Over the over time, we will see things improve, but it's, yeah, 
you can see all the, the so much shifting still. Great. So I don't see any other questions, so I'll take the prerogative to ask a different one. Um, so we talked a little bit about U.S. policy, but what about European policy? I know that was uh, spoken a little bit um, with Rebecca when you were presenting. What about things like GDPR and data consent requirements? What? How does that all play into all this? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> um, I suppose from the publisher perspective, like we have to be aware that different authors are subject to different legislative requirements, different policy requirements from the funders. So we try not to be super specific about things like GDPR versus HIPAA, for example, although we do have quite high level guidance. Um, again, I think we're in a tricky position in some ways because it's at the point of publication that most of the time the author is thinking about data sharing and um, so it often wouldn't have happened up to that point but at the same time we can't give super specific guidance on things like GDPR and we would expect that the institution or the library is there to assist so yeah I think in being subject to so many um, global policies um, it becomes more and more difficult and we do rely on the institutions to give the best guidance to the researchers obviously we are on hand to like point people in the right direction if authors do have questions but it does become quite challenging <laughs> anyone else want to tackle that one no <laughs> okay fair enough um we do have a question that has come from on andrea so it says what happens if if the new US requirements for data management and sharing are not met, are academic institutions or individual scholars for that point uh, penalized in some way? Okay, so under the policy, there are no waivers, right? That you, this is a policy, you agree to these terms and conditions when you accept the money from the government. So you sign an agreement that says this is a condition of your funding. So you're breaking your contract. It's not a contract, it's a grant. I deal with contracts, I apologize. But you're breaking your agreement with the government. So we expect you to follow this. But as a project officer, so um, as you saw on my slides, I had a couple different job titles because we I wear many hats at the organization. We have a conversation and we say, why can't you share it? It is a very different circumstance when I had, um, in my case, it was a contractor, not a grantee, but the same policy said, I can't share my data because this is the state law prohibits it. I can't. I'm not allowed to do this. I am dealing with a very low incidence population and this is really meaningful research. That to me is a world of difference versus I ran out of money or I don't want to. And so I think that that is something that we need. You need to have that conversation with your funder and see, is there a solution? Is there a workaround? But understand that for us, right? If there is, if it's a contract, you're not going to get paid for that deliverable if you don't produce it. If it's a grant, it's a different situation, but it may be something that will be looked at. Were you in compliance with the terms of your previous grant for both the publications and the data piece when you are applying for new funding? And you don't want to be someone who's been found in non-compliance. So have conversations early and often. Um, we understand the challenges and we also are creating guidance along the fly. So if there's something that is really hard to do, we want to make sure that you're able to comply because we want this to be successful. And if it's something that we wrote a policy that doesn't make sense, please let us know um, so we can work to find a solution. Anyone else want to add to that? Yeah, I can jump in just from an institutional perspective in supporting some of these policies. So um, and the one I'm most familiar with uh, recently is the NIH's new data management sharing policy. And so my understanding is compliance there is at an institutional level and um, it's not specific, um, but it does say future funding decisions for that institution. So um, this is something we're very concerned about in ensuring our PIs are compliant with. I will say there are um, a lot of um, uh, safety rails built in. So one thing we're seeing a lot of is feedback on the data management plan and the just-in-time period. So um, grant officers are um, asking PIs to be more specific, making sure their plan is in compliance. 
um, making sure they have reasonable things written in their data management plan, and also the assurance that that's a living document. So as long as you're thinking about early, it can change as circumstances change with the ultimate goals of making things as um, available as necessary, as close as, um, or as available as possible, as close as necessary. So I think that's been really useful. We, of course, have not seen any grants at the end, um, project closeout based on that policy yet because it came into effect in 2023. So, um, but definitely uh, we are keeping our eyes on it. Great, I have time for a couple more questions. So I'm gonna ask this last one. Uh, it says, thanks everyone. Do we have any helpful resources or strategies to help explain to HSS researchers what their research research data are? I'm going to jump in on this one. So um, I genuinely think that our data policy has done quite a good job, but that's because it's based on quite a bit of reading. So I was interested to see, like across the board, how is this usually explained? And there's a couple of resources that I would recommend, although I would also recommend filtering it for um, like a HSS um, researcher who might find it a bit much to go through. So um, they're both kind of European, but relevant across the board. Um, ALEA, which is um, uh, research academies in Europe, has a guide to fair humanities data. And then SESTA, which is social, social sciences, has a social sciences version of fair data sharing. And I found both of them quite approachable <laughs> if you're a bit of a data nerd um, and very useful. Um, but I do think there wasn't like the concise guidance that I was looking for, but I, I think I would really recommend them as a starting point if you don't mind having to digest something. I'll pop, put links, put links in the chat. I, I put in the chat, and this was in the Q&A as well, a toolkit that we developed. So this is different from our policy guidelines, right? That this is best practices. This is created for our awardees. So it's not, should hopefully it's not in conflict, Um, but it's designed to help you think through how to share your um data and how to structure it uh what i also said in the q a is that this policy at least for our agency is going into effect in october that means that that's when the first grants and contracts are awarded now if you know how the timeline works nothing is awarded in november because we don't or in october because we don't have money yet so it's not going to really the first grants and contracts aren't going to be awarded until 2025 and then they have to start work and they have to write their proposals. So you're not, we still have six months before I expect that first award to be made. And that's the start of the project. There's still gonna be then the time to do the work. So you're not, you're, we're gonna have many years to be coming up with guidance and working and asking questions. And so I encourage you to reach out to project officers, reach out to the points of contact, go to the conferences and talk to the, those individuals who are working on the policy on what guidance you need and what doesn't make sense because we're writing it as you speak and we want this to be helpful. Great. Anyone else? Is there any other question that the panelists want to ask each other? All right, otherwise I will close. Maybe I, is, I mean, yeah. I know we only have one minute, so this is probably oh, you, you, not very useful. And also I feel like a bit of an interloper having jumped in at the end and not having presented. Um, but um, but I I wonder, I mean, so getting back to a couple of threads that have come up, um, it always seems to me that there is so much more for us to do uh, in collaboration to support this these sorts of new mandates where we all, all of from all of our positions, we can see how much additional labor this is gonna create for researchers. We know that librarians have a hugely important perspective on how to support researchers, you know, that, that publishers see a different lens, agencies. I'd be interested to hear just quickly, like what's the one thing that you would do to increase collaboration to support researchers in, in sharing their data and working with these public access policies? I, I can start by saying the federal agencies for the U.S. departments um, are working really closely. There are mm -hmm. a lot of interagency working groups, which I believe were in existence for the Holdren memo. I was at the department when this was being implemented. I helped implement it, but I was not an active participant in those. Um, 
we are constantly meeting. Um, we are meeting today with the White House, where a group of publishers and other organizations and agencies on how can we start implementing this. So I do think there are lots of conversations happening. The challenge is that this is a government-wide mandate and or different governments. And so we aren't having the social science conversations as directly um, because there are a lot of physical and natural scientists, but there are informal conversations happening on it. How do you do this? How do you be reasonable? But I think more conversations can happen. Alicia? Yeah, I'll just add in that um, there's a lot of conversations at institutional levels too. And one in particular I wanna call out is a recent um, summit for academic institutional readiness in data sharing or STAIRS that was funded by NIH that brought a number of institutions together to talk about our readiness and preparedness to meet um, these data sharing mandates. And that was immensely helpful. So more of those would be great. Excellent. Um, and I think I will wrap up with that. And I wanna thank all of our speakers. I think this has been a really useful uh, session. I learned a lot. And I also wanna, of course, thank our sponsors, AIP Publishing, KGL, NISO, Geoscience World, and STM. So thank you all, because otherwise we couldn't have done this. And of course, look for more course events, which do help hopefully all of our stakeholders, institutions, and funders and publishers get together and handle these, these uh, very important issues. And I wanna thank everyone for attending today and enjoy the rest of your day. So long. Thank you.